Good evening, everyone. Oh, you are about to, uh, for the next hour, you are about to enter a world beyond worlds, a world of sight and sound, a world where imagination runs rampant, a world where you will see grown ups wearing rubber costumes fighting monsters made of rubber, and you will believe it. <laughs> you are now entering Ultraman the Early Years. one man named Eiji Tsuburaya was born. He first saw, when he first saw his own movie, like a movie, he was really enamored by what was going on with this movie. When he could, he bought himself a movie projector just to take it apart to see how it worked. This eventually led him into the special effects realm of filmmaking and he, got, he was hired by Toho to work on propaganda films during World War II and eventually a monster movie called Godzilla. He was one of the, he's basically Japan's father of special effects. He would go on and work with Toho for many years, creating kaiju films, and then he created his own television studio in the late 60s when television was really taking off. The Twilight Zone was a huge hit in Japan, and the television network said to Tsuburaya, hey, we would like to have our own television series that's like the Twilight Zone. So he decided, well, giant monsters are pretty are popular. They want a television uh, show that's just like Twilight Zone. Let's make a TV series with monsters that's going to basically be, each episode is going to be a mini kaiju film. And this series they ended up calling Ultra Q, which is basically, I mean, this launched in 1966 and was a huge success instantaneously that the television studio wanted more. So here are just a few little clips from Ultra Q. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You just crossed over into... Q's run, the television station said, this is really great. Can you do another series that will have a superhero in it? So Subaraya and his team went to the drawing board to come up with a series that had a hero. They originally came up with this hero called Red Man because they were going to make his body red 
because uh, for Mars, since back then, whenever you thought of aliens, most people thought of, oh, Martians coming from Mars. So he picked red for Martian, for Mars, and then he gave the superhero a silver type armor that for usually the chrome color of a spaceship, which you'd see spaceships look like. Like I said, they were originally going to be called Red Man. He ended up deciding, no, Red Man just sounds a little too on the nose. Let's call him Ultraman. Now with Ultraman, he, he was a, basically Ultraman is from this race of space cops. If you're familiar with American comic books in the DC Universe, you have the Green Lantern Corps, which are space cops. That's basically what the Ultra Race is in the Ultra series. Is there are these beings who were humanistic, acquired this power that turned them into giant beings, often red and silver with some variations on the designs, and they just became, like I said, space cops. So at the opening of Ultraman, the, the original Ultraman is chasing a monster, a criminal monster, ends up killing a guy who, work, who is part of this military organization that defends society from giant monsters or alien invasions and whatever and the like. Well, so the space, so Ultraman basically gives him his life and they share a body kind of like, think of Shazam from DC where it's two beings that inhabit one body and he can change his uh, well, four. So whenever he transforms into Ultraman, he grows giant. And he just fights monsters and sometimes the space patrol or the, the science patrol is useful. Sometimes they're not, but they're basically all around the world and Hayata doesn't always remember everything that occurs when he's Ultraman. I'm so sorry. Kimi wa itta nani mono da? M77 Now, when Ultraman was coming towards the end of his run, they, the television network was like, once again, this is a hit, can we have more episodes? And Eiji Tsuburaya felt that there was nothing more they could do with the Ultraman series. He had pretty much run the course, he had other episodes that were rejected scripts, so he felt, well, there's nothing more I could do with this. So the network's like, well, we still want to do something new, something interesting. 
So fo the following year, 1967, they worked in a series that was going to be about a military team fighting off alien invaders. It was going to be directed by a man who lived in um, Okinawa. Okinawa, who every day, anytime he left Okinawa, he had to prove to the U.S. Uh, military why, why he got, ha would have to go back and forth every day. And he felt like he was an alien to his own nation. So he had this idea, well, what if we do a series where every episode we have alien invaders are coming in to the, war to the Earth and we have a team that has to defend them. And then they took that idea, which was going to be called Ultra Guard, and combined it with concepts of Ultraman with a character named Ultra Seven. Now, in, as opposed to Ultraman, where we had Hayata, who was killed by Ultraman to become, and becoming the character, this one was Ultra Seven comes to Earth and takes up a secret identity he, of a guy he calls Dan Moraboshi that he based off a person he actually rescued early uh, when he first arrived on Earth. So this one is, ends up being the adventures of the Ultra Guard defending the Earth from alien invaders, and it also touched up on social issues. There's one episode that I'll show some clips from where they come up, where the Earth has come up with this like nuclear bomb that can destroy all uh, alien planets. And Dan is like, well, what happens if they come up with a better bomb? Well, then we'll just bi build a bigger bomb. And he starts to question, are these the people I really want to defend? And there are also these little capsule monsters that I don't have a clip of in here that he would use occasionally, a couple times, which were these little capsules he would throw and a monster would come out of it, which is actually where Toriyama took the idea for the capsule technology in Dragon Ball from. And also, if you know, on Ultra 7, you'll notice he has this blade on his helmet, which is actually where Toriyama got for Chi Chi's design in the original Dragon Ball series with her helmet. There's all sorts of Dragon Balls. There's all sorts of Ultraman references. <laughs>君たちの計画は全てバグるさと。おとなしく口を。我々の実験は十分成功したのさ。実験そうだ。赤い結晶体が人類の頭脳を狂わせるのに十分効力があることが分かったの。教えてやろう。我々は人類が互いにルールを守
Sav is a dick. But then again, a lot of the Ultras are. In the original Ultraman, there was one monster that they had a Godzilla suit that they were using, but he had like this frill, um, the lap the lap the la the, la the dinosaur from Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah, yes. And he rips the frill off the monster and starts doing here, like, come and get it. He's trying to do a Toro thing with Yes. So and the other thing with Ultra 7 that I like a lot, because that's my personal favorite Ultra series, is Ultra 7 can change sizes. He doesn't always fight a monster giant, and unlike Ultraman, which was usually you have the monster appears, they try to solve the problem, Ultraman appears, they, they finish the monster off, the end. Ultra 7, sometimes you might have a battle in the middle of the episode. Sometimes there might be a battle that's like three seconds long of just Ultra 7 transforming, fixing a problem and flying off, and then they have to finish the rest in human mode with the rest of his team. Well, after Ultra 7 had ended, Eiji e. Tsuburaya was like, you know, we've got a nice little trilogy here. Let's move on to some other projects. So he, they worked on projects for a little bit, and he started to have these ideas to bring Ultraman back. Unfortunately, he passed away before he was able to realize those ideas. So his son took over the project, Hajime, and he's like, we're going to bring Ultraman back. Initially, they were planning to bring the original Ultraman back to Earth and decided during production, well, you know what, let's make it be a new Ultraman, which did get a little confusing because there's one point where one of the aliens from the first series comes back wanting to get revenge on Ultraman and acts like it's the same Ultraman he fought prior. So with the return of Ultraman, we've got this character named Go. He's a race car driver, he's got a girlfriend, he, 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 li he basically lives with his, her family, with her brothers, and he ends up rescuing a boy and a dog and gets killed in the process, so the Ultra is like, eh, this is worthy, you deserve to uh, become partners with me. So they went back to, okay, the character had died, so now he shares a body with the Ultra character. And it was a pretty, pretty uh, impactful series. There's things that happen towards the end, you're like, whoa, they didn't see that coming. And they really went into Go, uh, Go's life over everything. Go is not exactly the greatest human being ever, despite being noble. As at times he can be very sexist, and he doesn't care if he slaps a kid. <laughs> As you do. Try again. Okay. There we okay. go. Oh, snap. Thank you, Mr. Oh, snap. Thank you, Mr. の危険も帰り見ず子供を助けようとした君に感動をしただから君に命を預けるいや危険ですプレイスはネクロフィリアックスナイトメアお父さんの事故は警察もマットも調査してあの時本当に大事が出たんだ嘘をつけろ<笑
And it also introduced a new character by the name of Father of Ultra, who was the first time they really ended up showing off that there's more than just the Ultraman we have come to see in the main series. Unfortunately, kids hated the idea of a man and a woman combining to form an Ultra character. Kids were like, oh, we can't play as that of the playground because there's a girl in there, cooties! So, halfway through the series, they ended up getting rid of the female character and just had that Hokuto, the main guy, was the one who took over the identity of Ace and it's been that way ever since. Well, Ultra and Ace started to have some ratings decline so Tsuburaya's like, well, our next series, we need to make more child-friendly. We need to appeal to children. <gasps> and that's what they decided to do. They decided to make a series that revolved around fairy tales, hence the name Ultraman Taro, because Taro was meant to be the peach boy, Mamo Taros. And they wanted to make a child-friendly series, which completely drew off, like, completely th drew off the adult audiences who were growing up on Ultraman. They're like, oh, this is too childish for me. It's confusing based on the clips you see because it's like, this is for kids? <laughs> However, it also introduced Mother of Ultra, who was the first true female Ultra character that was around, that would come in to help Taro. She's, her son had died, in the I mean, her, her Ultra son had died, Taro didn't have a mother and he gets injured, so she takes Taro and merges the two together so he's kind of like Ultra 7 where he's, he is the Ultra, even though it wasn't his body originally. And Taro is a very weird show, as I said. There's a lot of oddities that go on in the plots. You get to see them play volleyball against a monster. Uh, the commander at times, he will make his decision on who goes on the field based on what they ate the night before. 
If he ate curry the night before and anyone else ate curry, they're the ones going out on the field. Stomachs out, turning the monsters' babies into a delicacy, kicking pre monsters in the groins, and all that fun stuff. But adults hated it. I mean, yeah. So Subaraya decided to get their Zack Snyder on. I was gonna make a joke about Warrior Within as well, <laughs> for anyone who's played Prince of Persia. Mm. God, that was a fucking whiplash going into Warrior Within. <laughs> so they decided, okay, uh, ratings are down. Costs are going up because of the oil crisis, so we need to do something new. Let's make a series as dark as we can, which then kids found too dark, so they were turned off by it. It's really is warrior with it. And this one, Ultraman Leo, he's kind of again, he's kind of like Seven. He's an Ultra from another universe whose planet was destroyed, so he took refuge onto Earth and ended up becoming the Earth's defender. Now in this one, Ultra 7 ends up becoming his mentor because Dan Moroboshi is in charge of the military organization. But the problem I with Dan in this one is he's a complete douchebag to this dude. He'll try to run him over with a truck just to get him to train better. 
But also, Ultraman Leo, he had a brother that would occasionally just randomly show up. He's like, oh, my brother, you're alive? Yeah, hi. Okay, we defeat the monster. Okay, bye. bye. It's like, uh, did you just tuxedo mask me? You didn't even do anything. <laughs> you didn't even do anything. So here we have our The Clips of Leo. But all the dirt. So yeah, as you saw, there was an Ultraman King who was introduced. He's in like two episodes, and then he kind of disappears into the more modern stuff. There's also this arc at the end of the show that they decided to do another type of whiplash, and got they got rid of like 90% of the cast members and replaced them with newer ones, which was kind of odd. But as I said, the oil crisis was causing production costs to go up. They cut out a lot of beam effects that Ultraman Leo would do to go for a more martial arts based uh, fighting style. The series still didn't get the ratings they wanted because as I said, kids were turned off from it. Adults had already left the series and they didn't gain many adults back after Taro. So Ultraman went on a hiatus. In 1979, anime would at, was at its peak. So Tsuburaya teamed up with Sunrise to create an anime Ultraman series, which did extremely well. Later on in the 80s, they would team up with Hanna-Barbera to do an Ultraman series for America, an Ultraman, well, it was supposed to be a series for America, and it would just be coming a movie. And then there was another series with chibi style Ultras that was set millions of years into the future. The entire universe is at peace. So the way they have, instead of fighting each other, they, have, they hold tournaments. Instead of having massive ma uh, mass destruction across the galaxy. The tournaments are apparently what keep everyone in check. Because I guess they're like, yeah, cool, I could destroy the galaxy, but uh, sure, I'll, do, I'll participate in a tournament.
control now. Son, I wanted to get into the fight. Sure you did, you coward. そして解説は宇宙一の天才科学者野谷博士でお送りしますおお、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、お、
ウルトラマン DT だったしかしウルトラマンに変身するところを見られたら地球上にはいられないのだったプラスとマイナスの力を合体させて何倍もの強さになっている我々の力を合わせて戦うんだいいわエイティthat pretty much killed Ultraman in Japan for several years. In 1992, I want to say it is, 1990, they decided Super Mario wanted to bring Ultraman worldwide. So they first did the, uh, approached Australia to do a TV series, which ended up calling Ultraman Towards the Future. If you grew up in the 90s, you would probably see these Ultraman toys in KB Toys and Toys R Us's. And they were actually all based on this series, which was an Australian-based show. It only lasted 13 episodes. It's not bad, not exactly great, but it was an interesting spin, and the commander pretty much just hams up the entire series that he is the best thing about this show. That's all there really is to it, because there's not much in the way of character development. Life 
malfunction. It's almost human. And I want to see it almost dead. things worse. What are you, an expert on these morons? You don't have to fight. But they're going to hurt her. If you really love her, this is not the way to show her. What would you know about love? <laughs> if you keep this up, you'll lose her. But I'm jealous, I love her. Well, you'll have to show her. How? Be smart. Do the right thing. stupid. <laughs> but yeah, if you're desperate, call Ultraman. <laughs> he apparently has dating advice for aliens and whatever. Finally, they decided, hey, America, you want your own Ultraman series, right? And they decided to come up with this concept, this show called Ultraman the Ultimate Hero. This show was riddled with production issues galore. To say the least. Subaraya teamed up with this brand new immersion company that said, yeah, we'll, we'll take up doing an Ultra series as long as you guys are willing to pay the budget for it. So Subaraya really wanting to expand Ultraman to the American market said, sure, we could do that. Well, what the company decided to do is the executives took 75% of all the funding they were given by Subaraya and went on vacation. They let, their, they let the, the actors take over the roles of being the director of episodes. Sometimes they had to be the writers of episodes on top of directing them. Sometimes the writers had to be the directors as well. Also, there was one incident when they were driving the monster suits to the location and one of the monster suits fell out and fell down into a ditch. So they had that lovely experience. The suit actor for the Ultraman character said that wearing that costume was a nightmare because it, what, they would have electronics in the helmet that would not have any covering over the wires, so his face would often get burned in while they were filming. The electronics did not always work, and the suits were very stiff to the point where nobody in the production wanted them to do anything truly agile-wise with them in case they broke because they didn't have replacements. So this show is really, really bad. Uh, it's horrendous, but at the same time, it's so bad, it's actually enjoyable to just to see how badly they fail. Now, one thing I do give the show credit for is the design department. All the monsters are redesigned creatures from the original Ultra series, and a lot of them look really damn cool. There's one monster throughout the franchise whose name is Red King. But in the franchise, his skin color is usually a white and blue tone. This was the first time he was actually red. But these two clips I have just kind of show the worst aspects of this series. And the biggest problem also is it's boring.
I've wondered many, many Maybe times. Maybe they're like, <gasps> we, we don't want to film. Like, oh yeah, we're filming. <laughs> 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 He's going. Why don't you pay less convince him to leave? Well, my job here is done. Shut up. But, but you didn't even do anything. Shit. That's so, the worst, worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I have watched some crappy, crappy things. So, another few other interesting things in this series though. There's one episode also where there's one monster who's an underground monster and you actually see him lift his hands up to move the carpets off the street so he can walk out of from underneath the stage. And now funny enough though, the guy who plays the ultra hero of uh, the main, the host is actually Ken Kosogi, who is Ninja Black in Kaku Ranger, the son of Show Kosugi, who's from the American Ninja movies. Or if you've ever seen DOA, he plays Ryu yep, Hayabusa. Yeah, Ryu Hayabusa in the Dead or Alive movie. Sorry, action. that's just an easy way for most people to know because how can you not know DOA? Or Godzilla Final Wars, he's in that as well. Yeah. All right, so after Towards the Future, in 1996, so Ultraman would take back up, and outside of having breaks uh, every few years, the Ultra franchise is still going today. There's an American comic book series that has been made. There's a new movie from, oh God. The, the uh, guy, Hideki Anno, who yes. did Evangelion Shin Godzilla, called Shin Ultraman, coming out in Japan next month. Yeah, so pretentious is to the extreme. I love the pretentious. And they're, they're trying to get some sort of Hollywood movie get, uh, made. Yeah. So Ultraman is still going strong. I will eventually end up covering more in future panels. I just thought about something. If they made a Hollywood movie, hopefully it would be like the one that James Franco and Seth Rogen did about Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> that would just be about the production of this movie. <laughs> so here I have a copy of Ultra 7 to give away on Blu-ray from so, Mill Creek. Yes, and Mill Creek is actually, um, since we're recording this, I might as well say it, Mill Creek is one of our sponsors who actually gives us all of the different series um, to review for our channel. Plus, they give us a whole lot of other stuff that I have absolutely no idea why. Yeah, they recently gave me a Magnum PI Blu-ray box set for the entire series. I'm like, thanks? Which is like $150. I'm like, uh, Like, awesome, thanks. I've never seen this before, but let's do an unboxing video. How did you never see Because I'll just, they'll send me boxes, so I'll just do unboxing videos, and sometimes like, yeah, this should be the latest Ultraman release. Oh, the king and I? What, what is this? He got I Dream of Genie, which was awesome for me. <laughs> but anyway. So, for everyone who was paying attention, I know there's all five of you, so it's not like a hard thing. I know, I actually like that you all stayed, especially you not knowing this, so thank you. Well, we you. hope you enjoyed it. It was kind of, I have to say, it was pretty entertaining to see, like, you know, Power Rangers as, like, yeah. Uh, over the top acting, the dynamic the bad guys just like slamming around. Oh, yes. This predates both Sentai and Kamen Rider, which came before Power Yep. Oh, yeah, that's right. Since that's where the footage and all that came from. Oh, Ultraman yeah. predates all that. It's yeah, Ultraman's yeah. basically the godfather of tokusatsu, which is special effects. Yeah. Because all those live action shows, they're called tokusatsu since they deal in special effects. Yeah. So, what is our. So I'm going to make this kind of easy because um, I want to see how people, he's a teacher, so why not? Um, so he talked about during the panel how Ultraman 80 kind of killed the franchise. How long was it before the next Ultra series? Full length Ultra series. I'll let you choose. 15 years? Yes. 15 years. Awesome. Yeah, we always give away free things at our panels. Oh, I forgot to mention, I do have candy from a stranger if anybody would like any. <laughs> any questions on Ultraman? Well, yes? Aren't they celebrating 55 years right now? That was last year, but they're technically still celebrating it. So. But yeah, last year they did just celebrate their 55th anniversary. Actually, all the shows they did, uh, 
Ultraman's 55th anniversary, Kamen Rider's 50th anniversary, and Super Sentai's 45th anniversary last year. So all the big Toku shows had their big anniversaries last year. And just for awareness, if these are too kitty, and I know I say that loosely after you saw the taro, um, but the one benefit of Tokusatsu is there are different series based on your pl proclivities, let's well, say. You're interested in. Yeah, yeah what? like if you're into horror movies and horror aspects, there's a franchise called Garo that mixes, that I say it's like Devil May Cry meets Kamen Rider be, with a touch of Onimusha because it's a horror-based series with these superhero, super armored heroes in it. And if you want to ever freak somebody out, tell them that most of your live action tokusatsu shows feature porn stars <laughs> as their first acting roles. So it's fascinating when you're watching a screen and you're like, is that really how she acts? But then again, uh, she only did other things for her. Life. Any other questions? Well, I hope you. Oh, yes. I was trying to ask, uh, what do you think of the new Netflix series? I know it started off as a manga, but I was just We finished. have not watched the second season. It's been, I have to say, it's been so long, I've kind of lost interest in the second I, season. So I like the first season. Um, the challenge for me is. I am very particular about art style, so I don't, I don't have a problem with it, but the art style did throw me off initially. Um, uh, if you have not seen it, it's a CGI, yeah. uh, uh, basically CGI anime that Netflix is And doing. it's a great introduction, in all honesty, for anyone who has not seen Ultraman and may not be interested in the live action counterpart. Yeah, this, the, this anime, it follows the concept of the original Ultra show. But instead of having more Ultra series after, it's what Hayata, after him and Ultraman separated at the end of the original show, his blood was still tainted with, with the Ultra blood in his DNA. So that went on to his son, giving him his son superpowered abilities. And all of Japan, the government created these armored suits that are based on Ultra characters because of Ultraman, because now they know, well, there's alien threats everywhere. And then they also were like, well, we saw how these abilities work. We're going to learn how these abilities work. And now we're creating armored suits to deal with this. So it's an interesting concept. Um, it's also done by Netflix. Um, Netflix Japan, I think, is the one who's... And Subaraya. Yeah. Well, obviously Subaraya. But um, it's, it's a challenge because it is interesting. But after watching the live actions, I will say initially I was caught off guard because I'm so used to them growing giant for them being based on their own individual series. So it's it's kind of like watching a live action. It's like when you watch an anime and when you watch a live action adaptation, you're kind of thrown for a loop because you're like, this is not what I know. And it's kind of the reverse of that. Yeah. But I still think it's definitely worth a watch and it is a great introduction like i said for people who may not know the franchise because especially if you have partners significant others or friends that may not be interested in the live action shows because that's the one challenge about the anime community is they're not fans of live action they're mainly the animated side and there's nothing wrong with that uh, you everybody has their own interests and you can't you can't knock somebody for it but that's why we do panels like this because there there is that interest in the other art forms that Japan has outside of the anime but at least it's a great way just because just like um, Kamen Rider Double if you're familiar with the other franchises they're actually doing an anime so that's another nice way of introducing somebody to a series that was originally live action that's now anime. Yeah, and the cool thing is right now there's a lot of ultra series that you can watch on Tubi or Shop Factory's website for free. So you can all, so you can go on there, see what they have, watch an episode or two, test it out, be like, eh, that one didn't work for me. Go to another one. Ooh, this one I like. I'm, I'm going to check this one out. And if you don't have cable, which it took me a long, long time to give up cable because I was raised 
in that environment, if you have um, like any apps, look for Pluto TV. Pluto TV has what's called a channel, it's called Toku Shoutsu. It's basically by the company Shout that releases a lot of indie movies, they release Kamen Rider and things like that. They actually have an entire channel dedicated to watching live action series of tokusatsu, of anything really Japan. So if you ever want to watch Ultraman or Kamen Rider or Super Sentai, this entire channel will give you an opportunity to catch snippets to even see it will be of interest or worth it to you. The only one that's really absent that has had US releases has been Garo, which is kind of saddening. But other than that, yeah, the Toku is such a great world. Uh, yes, Anthony. I just wanted to ask, where would Gridman be placed with all these Ultra things? So Gridman came out in 94, which would be right before Ultraman Tiga. So Gridman is technically, it's live action. Um, Gridman, for anybody who's not aware, um, is done also by Subaraya. And it's another suited hero. Um, they Which, actually have an anime from a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, called SSSS Gridman. Which is, which is shorthand for an old American adaptation of something yes. called Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad. Yes, and it's a great anime as well, so... Um, in fact, the funny thing is in that anime, they also bring up the fact that they're like, the lady's like, yeah, Red King was only read in one Ultraman series. So... That, that's one of the really cool things about like Ultraman and any other series is they they merge into multiple And even uh, Subaraya has their own American YouTube channel where, you, where they'll air the current airing series, they are subtitled. Yes, and so they and, leave it up for two weeks at a time. Well, now they're just putting it up permanently. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, but yeah, they'll, uh, they'll, 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 the YouTube channel, will they'll hit the YouTube channel the exact same time they premiere on Japanese TV. Ah. And those series, all the ultra, new Ultra series, they pre usually premiere in July and end at the end of December, early January. So, did everyone have a lot of fun? Did you at least enjoy and learn something? Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, you so much.